Uh, welcome uh, to our evening. We're uh, so thrilled uh, to have Kate Knuth here. Uh, Kate is the founder of Democracy and Climate and has been uh, researching uh, uh, climate action uh, for <laughs> quite a while. She was the uh, resilience officer, is that right, from uh, Minneapolis? Uh, and uh, is uh, very knowledgeable about all things climate. Uh, I read a white paper that she had written a couple of years ago, and so was happy to see this tonight. Um, so uh, as we get started, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, who is the uh, executive director for League of Women Voters Minnesota. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks everyone for taking time out of this lovely winter evening, which we're all growing weary of probably, but um, it is very pretty and white um, out there. And I wanted to just take a couple of minutes to um, get you excited, hopefully in your local leagues to um, take advantage of a new initiative we will soon be starting called our, um, it'll be our Climate Change Action Challenge. One of the things that we do at the League, right, is we know that our democracy is really founded on all of the small actions we do every day that add up to a great, um, you know, the great river of democracy we enjoy. And I think with climate change, we really have to embrace that. There are a lot of ways to get to reducing our emissions. And it seems overwhelming, right, at times. But I'm really proud of the League for, again, being that group on the ground. And those of you who may not be members of the League, we invite you to join us um, to be those members on the ground that help put all of these, all of our beans in the jar that one day spill over into real change. And I want to point it out today, um, yesterday was our big day where our maps were introduced. So our redistricting maps were introduced yesterday. And what does that have to do with climate change? Uh, a lot, right? Because our whole playing field has now changed. We are, um, the map was a least change map. Um, overall does not look heavily gerrymandered. There's lots of things, a lot of good things happen in the maps, but I wanted to point out one really important thing as we go forward, and that is the number 89. When it comes to maps and comes to the census and comes to climate change, 89 people, if we had not counted, if we had counted 89 people less in the census, we would have lost a congressional district. And that means all the work we did, imagine all the work our league did and others did to help make sure that everyone was counted that resulted in far more representation for, he, for us in Minnesota to hopefully get our representatives to also make that change for us. So I say that um, again, because it's so important, the small things we might do and we feel like, oh, is it making a difference? It does. And it's those kinds of actions that make the difference. So thank you very much. We hope if you're not a member of the league, you'll join us, join our climate change task force. Um, and or our lobby and observer corps. We have a very robust group of over 30 members meeting to help with our lobbying at the state level. So all that can be found on our website at lwvmn.org. We also have a wonderful climate change task force who is over 150 strong now and is bringing this program to you tonight. And I know that Carol Stoddart is somewhere in this list of people. And Carol, if you can open up your mic and tell people about our climate change task force. Hi, yes, I am here, Michelle. I'm very <laughs> so glad here. to be here. I'm very glad to be here. Um, yeah, I was, I was so thrilled when I retired and I found out about the existence of the climate change task force because this is exactly what I've been looking for. I've been looking for a way that I can actually be involved in helping make change and um, the league has given me that opportunity. And what uh, we're, the, we now have 120 people signed up for the task force. We meet on the first Wednesday morning of every month 
And what we're learning on this journey together is that a growing majority of people are like us in that we believe that climate change is absolute science. Nobody's, we're not denying it, but we don't know what to do about it. And we're looking for ways to be involved to help make a change. And um, the, the league is giving that opportunity. So I heartily invite all of you, eagerly invite all of you. You just, you can go onto the, the, the League of Women Voters website and you will find under, what is it, things that we do? Is that what it's called, Michelle? Yep, yeah, you'll see on the top, things we do. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah what we do. That, and then you'll go down to the Climate Change Task Force and then there'll be a, a link there where you can actually click and sign up to get invited to upcoming meetings. So I really suggest that you do And that. I'll put that in the chat too. Thanks, Carol. All right, so thanks so much. And um, we welcome you all again. And Kathleen, if you wanna tell us a little bit more about all we're going to see here tonight. Sure, before we did that, did you mention the Lobby Observer Corps? Yes, I did, I did. yeah. All yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's another thing, again, I will put, um, while, while Kathleen's talking and getting Kate set up, I will put these links in um, the chat. Okay, very good. And we've gotten several new people who have come in from the waiting room while we've been introducing ourselves. Um, so if, uh, if you wanna just put your name and your league uh, or your city uh, down in the chat, that would be great. And just a little housekeeping, it, as I'm looking, Looking through the chat, it looks as though perhaps Roseville, uh, Woodbury, Edina, and Northfield would like to have a breakout. If I've missed a city uh, that wants to meet together in the Zoom room uh, afterwards, uh, uh, put it in the chat uh, and you'll have a chance to click on a city and join uh, that group. I suppose if you're not from that city, they will welcome you anyway. Uh, so uh, I am really pleased to introduce Kate Knuth uh, for a side-by-side -side look at city's climate action plans. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I am really happy to be here with you all tonight um, and talk about a new, um, paper that I have um, recently released with the 100% campaign and also just talk about city climate action work and um, the amazing work many cities around our state are doing and the ways folks can get involved um, in this work together. So uh, just a quick background about, about me as a as, um, Kathleen mentioned, I, I have a business is called Democracy and Climate LLC. And I, I, I think I, I'm, I've been very excited to talk to you all at the league um, since scheduling this because I really see our ability, our ability to navigate the climate change era with any sort of grace and justice requiring us to really dig deep and um, uh, strengthen our democracy as an essential part of that work. And, you know, I've been in, I, I have been involved in our democracy in multiple different ways. I served in the state house from 2007 to 2012, ran in significant part because of my concern about climate change at that point. Um, and then worked at the University of Minnesota while I was working on a PhD um, and then uh, was our city's first chief resilience officer. And, and I ran for mayor of Minneapolis um, in 2021. And one of the things I put forward was a Minneapolis Green New Deal uh, platform. And, and I will just note there's, yes, we have to reduce emissions fa faster. Yes, we have to undo the systemic racism. That means uh, people of color are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. We absolutely need to do those things. And I had the sixth part of the Green New Deal platform is really, strengthening democracy through and as part of this work. And I see city climate action planning processes and then implementing them as just such a great way for folks to get involved in really 
coming together to take action on the climate crisis we're living through. And I'm happy to talk about more specifics about climate change later. This is not a talk about the science of climate change or the impacts of climate change is very focused on uh, what cities in Minnesota are doing. So I am going to um, share uh, my screen. I've just got a few slides, about 10, 15 minutes here, and then really interested in hearing more about your questions and comments um, as well. So I am going to start here um, and and just share more about this, this um, overview and review of city climate action plans in Minnesota. It's, it's hot off the presses or hot on the, <laughs> the internet. Um, it was released, we had a special event on the 10th and then sent a wide release email earlier this week. So this is really uh, recently um, completed work. And you know, we started with this idea that cities really matter for climate action. And you know, as someone who's been working in the climate space for a long time, I can look at a picture like this and there's so many places where I can see the decisions we make as individuals and as a collective, um, how it impacts our ability to reduce emissions and also our ability to handle what climate change is already underway. So, you know, this is a picture of St. Paul and, um, you know, lovely, uh, lovely city. And, you know, cities have decision making about how the streets are defined, designed, how much energy or how dense the development is, which has an impact on how much people need to use fossil fuel to get around. Um, decisions about investing in city owned buildings or, you know, in St. Paul, a great action, a great example is changing out the lights in parking ramps, which, you know, seems like sort of a, maybe not a big thing, but you can get like 50, 60% uh, improvements in energy efficiency. So really important things that cities have control over. And cities have really important powers to act on climate. And, you know, you are all government people in a way you understand democracy and government governance and cities have really important roles in terms of the things that make it easier for each of us as individuals to make climate smart decisions, to better prepare us and our communities for climate change, and to do things that we as individuals frankly can't do alone. So land use planning and regulation are really important in terms of where people live, how they move, the density, things like that. Infrastructure planning and, and investment, including water and transportation. Um, cities can catalyze action in ways that individuals or even individual organizations can do. By definition, they're our government. We all get to have a say, and so they can bring us together and convene and organize communities in ways that um, different community groups can. Cities can make public investments. They can help catalyze bigger investments with public investment and more. I'm sure we can talk about more things that cities can do. And the thing is, cities in Minnesota have really been acting on climate solutions. And it was a little challenging to kind of wrap my head around this report and how much is happening because cities are working on climate in a bunch of different ways. A big one is comprehensive planning. In the metro area, comprehensive planning is required every 10 years, has to be submitted through the Met Council. Um, cities outside of the metro can also do comprehensive planning, you know, Rochester, Duluth, um, Albert Lee have comprehensive plans, um, but cities have really important planning and zoning, even if it's not through comprehensive planning outside of the metro as well. A lot of cities in Minnesota have also taken part in a program called Partners in Energy. This is run through Excel Energy, and these cities create energy action plans with the support of Excel Energy. Um, and a lot of times these energy action plans then lead to a more comprehensive climate action plan. A subset of cities has done climate vulnerability assessments. So if you're not in the climate space, thinking ab about the, the way climate action is often split in their overlap, but split into two big buckets. One is reducing emissions, what's often called mitigation. How do we reduce emissions as fast as we can and as equitably as we can? And the other is adaptation and resilience. So we can already feel the impacts of climate change and we can make decisions individually and as a whole to make us more prepared for the climate impacts that are already underway. And so a climate vulnerability assessment is an example of how a jurisdiction can understand what climate change impacts are underway and who and where is most vulnerable to those impacts. There was a you can see the impact of different levels of government with this one. There was a state grant from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency that funded 23 cities from across the state to do these climate vulnerability assessments. 
A handful of cities have sustainability plans. These you could kind of think of them like climate action plans, but they're a little broader than what's often included in a climate action plan. And then a really important one that if you're not aware of, I really highly recommend folks check out is the Minnesota Green Step Cities Program. It's a public-private partnership through the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and a number of community groups. And um, it it's really a nation-leading program. It's a program that supports with technical support and options for actions for cities to do. Um, and about half of the population of Minnesota is in a green step city. I would say the city of Minneapolis is not a green step city and they have a pretty ambitious climate action plan. So if you add them to it, you get to a pretty significant percentage of the state's population. And then climate smart municipalities is a pretty small program, but it's a really kind of interesting one. It's um, an exchange between six Minnesota cities and six cities in Germany to learn about how to make the clean energy transition. So that's just laying the groundwork to, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, my screen is not advancing the way I wanted to. There we go. To um, this, uh, making the case why it's really important to understand and work in cities in terms of climate action. Something you may have seen in the news just a couple weeks ago, um, I guess it's almost a month ago at this point, uh, time sort of is flying, um, is 16 cities in Minnesota have declared a climate emergency and urge legislative action. And so council member Larry Kraft, who's there in the towards the front of that picture is a pretty newly elected council member in St. Louis Park, and he has helped organize a group of city council members from across the state to um, focus on climate policy, to have a, a stronger voice at the state level in terms of climate action, bringing that local voice to the state level, and then also um, share best practices and policies and approaches amongst the cities. And so these 16 cities are not all in the metro. They're not all the cities you would like think of necessarily off the top of your head. It's really a wide ranging group of cities, um, which is pretty exciting to see. You know, unfortunately, we're at the point of emergency, but it's exciting to see this kind of um, interest in leadership happening at the city level. So given all that context, <laughs> we at the 100% campaign decided to go deep on climate action plans. Before I, before I um, go into the report, a little bit about the 100% campaign. So I'm a contractor with the 100% campaign. I do research and policy development work with them. But the 100% campaign is really a coalition of unions and environmental groups and immigrant rights groups and other community um, community-based groups who are not all necessarily focused on climate change, but all interested in climate change in some way. And um, we're focused on getting Minnesota moving more quickly on making the transition to a clean, just energy future. Um, and Kathleen mentioned this white paper I wrote about a year ago, uh, really the first comprehensive overview of climate adaptation uh, research and policy in the state of Minnesota. And um, this is this this report comes out of some of the foundational work I and we did there. So in this in this report, you will find um, that we reviewed 12 cities across the state of Minnesota plus Hennepin County, which has is as far as we can tell the only county with a standalone climate action plan. I will note the city of Duluth just yesterday um, came out with their climate action work plan. Um, and I was joking with my colleagues. I was like, I thought we'd be current for at least like a week after we released this thing. Um, but we think it's great that Duluth has released it and um, I'm gonna be working to put it into the table, the side-by-side -side table um, over the next few days. So I'm aware that Duluth is, is stepping up and doing great work. So in this table, and it's basically a giant spreadsheet, in this table with 12 cities in Hennepin County, we have three categories of analysis. Overall plan design, like how was the community engaged? How does the plan discuss equity or not? Um, what kind of time frame does the plan talk about implementation resources, those sorts of things, like how, how do we make sense of the overall plan? And then there's sections, as I said, about greenhouse gas emissions reductions and then climate adaptation and resilience. Um, so I spent hours reading all of these plans and putting them into this spreadsheet um, and then uh, learned some things coming out of that. Um, 
just so you're aware of the cities that do have, I would say, standalone climate action plans, um, the ones we included. Minneapolis is the, the one that's been around the longest, although if you're from Minneapolis, you would be interested probably to know that Minneapolis is going to be updating its climate action plan this year. Um, they are, I think they'll be really announcing that process publicly pretty soon. Um, and then the rest of them, you know, starting in 2018 and then all up to December 2021. And then as we, I just mentioned, February uh, 2022. So a lot of cities really jumping on this climate action planning work. And if, a, if your city is not here or um, this is not the approach your city has taken, they may include climate and clean energy and adaptation and resilience and comprehensive plans or other city plans. You know, for example, the Ramsey County has a really pretty amazing climate resilience chapter of their um, comprehensive plan. So some overall observations from, um, from the plans, and I'm just using pictures of all these plans because there's beautiful pictures of all the cities that are part of it. So here you see the cover of St. Paul's Climate Action and Resilience Plan, the, the cover of Albert Lee's Climate Action Plan. Um, it, overall, all of the cities have really pretty strong approaches to um, greenhouse gas inventory. So what that means is they have basically done an accounting of where the greenhouse gases in their community coming from. And I, I didn't write this specifically in the report, but just for your sense of understanding of where emissions come from, generally there's three big categories and really two categories where most of them come from. One is from transportation, how we get around from mainly combustion vehicles because um, cities are usually not counting uh, airplanes in their in their emissions. So how we get around is a huge source of emissions transportation, about probably about 40% in a lot of cities, give or take, depending on the make of the city. Um, and then the other big chunk of it is our buildings, how we heat those buildings and cool those buildings and power those buildings. And um, the way you really get at those kinds of emissions are making sure the power grid is cleaner, which I, I would actually argue is not like biggest thing for a city focus to focus on. And then make sure your buildings are efficient and have great conservation or weatherized and that we are electrifying everything we possibly can within our building sector to get basically get rid of the use of natural gas for our homes and our buildings. So overall, great. And, and then the small category I would say that I mentioned is um, waste and wastewater. So processing water and taking care of wastewater and taking care of solid waste usually is two or 3% of of the emissions of a city, give or take a little bit. Um, I would also note that um, most of the cities have more ambitious climate reduction targets than the state of Minnesota overall. So the state of Minnesota is committed to 80% reductions by 2050, 30 percent by 2025 and 15% by 2015. I'm not, they're, they're the targets from the um, Next Generation Energy Act passed in 2007. They are now out of date basically with what the best science shows. They are not, um, they do not put us in alignment with what is needed with the Paris Climate Accord that was um, adopted in 2015 and uh, to help us avoid the worst impacts of climate change and not hit 1.5 degrees warming. So not most, but not many, but not quite all of the cities are more aligned with the commitments needed under the Paris Accord. And also I would add um, the more recent ones tend to be more ambitious. So Minneapolis is not as ambitious as the others, but I would assume that with its update this year, it will more closely align with current science and, and up that ambition. And many, but again, not quite all of these plans try to um, uh, quantify the commitments they're making and the strategies and taxes they have and how much that will actually reduce emissions. Um, so they're really trying to grapple with the, the reality of what it looks like to reduce emissions at the pace and scale we need to. Um, so a, a big part of the plan or of the paper that I think is probably the most, in, I've got the feedback is the most interesting part is learning from best practices in these cities. And um, interestingly, when we, looking at these different reports, it's, you can start to see the different consulting groups that help with um, the different climate action plans. So I saw 
Someone here mentioned they're from Edina. Edina has a really ambitious plan, really comprehensive plan, super, super engagement, it looked like with the development of that plan. Um, Pale Blue Dot LLC was the major consultant. So if you look at say Albert Lee and Burnsville's plan, there's similarities among them. And Northfield is a plan that was developed with support from the Great Plains Institute, as was St. Paul. Um, and Red Wing with the Community Action Work Plan. So some of the best practices, I think overall, making sure um, the community is engaged in this work and see themselves as part of developing the plan and also even more important part of implementing it um, once it is adopted and in place, because that's where it really matters, it's the implementation. Um, making sure it's both about reducing emissions and includes adaptation and resilience. Both of those are really essential for us to thrive through the climate era. And any infrastructure investment we are making as a state, as a city, um, will, will take us through a climate changed era. And if we're designing stormwater systems that aren't big enough for the rains that we're experiencing and will continue to experience, or we're not taking into account an urban heat island effect when we're gonna have more 95 degree plus days than we've ever experienced as a state, then we're not making every choice we can to make sure that people can stay safe and healthy. Um, another really important best practice is centering um, equity, racial equity and um, economic equity you know, one, it, we, we can all talk about the, the racial inequity that's baked into our systems. And, and when we think about climate change, it basically, it ramps up risk. It ramps up any, anyone who is more vulnerable will be more highly impacted by climate change. And so that doesn't have to always be along lines of race. It doesn't always have to be along lines of income. It can also be from Things like age, older people are more susceptible to heat, need to be made sure they're protected in terms of ongoing heat waves. Younger people are more vulnerable in terms of their ability to navigate um, systems. And an example I like to give, because it's really, it's start, even as someone who's like worked in this space a lot, it's really startling to me. So I live in the city of Minneapolis and Minneapolis has been, was you know basically segregated through racial covenants and then, um, some communities, particularly communities of color, were underinvested in because of redlining. And this happened over time, over you know decades. Um, and so neighborhoods that are uh, lower income, higher percentage people of color, um, basically neighborhoods that were redlined uh, historically on the hottest days in the city are actually about 10 degrees hotter than non-redline neighborhoods. And when it's 90 or 95 degrees, 10 degrees is a huge deal in terms of people's basic health and safety and well-being. And why is that? It's because there's less green space. It's because there's less urban tree canopy. It's because there's more things heating up. And communities are often, in people in these communities often have less resources to say have air conditioning running. Um, so we really need to think about how these different inequities play together. And I think a really important best practice. Another really, I think, useful best practice to look for and think about um, if you're working on climate action planning is making sure there's a focus on near term big impact actions. So the more we can reduce emissions near term, the better off we are long term. So you could have the best long term goal. But if you like, don't do anything and then do it at the end, do it in 10 or 15 years, it's gonna be worse for the planet than if we do a steady decline or we do a significant decline and then figure out the rest. It's just the way the physics of the atmosphere work with the carbon dioxide. And so really being able to identify those closer, bigger actions and how we can focus on them together is a real strength of some of these climate action plans. Red Wing, I think is a great example here um, in terms of uh, focusing on it's, it's called the Climate Action Work Plan. It really focuses on the next five to seven years in terms of what can we do now. And then we'll figure it out again as technology gets better, as we see how the progress that we've made, as policy has changed, those sorts of things. Um, and then moving forward, it's really important, I think for us as interested residents and citizens to understand that implementation is really a really essential part of this work. Um, the, these plans are us getting aligned, us focusing on what we need to do and figuring out that path forward, figuring out how to staff the resource it with staff, where we can align financial resources. 
but really reducing the emissions is so essential to actually creating a safer climate for all of us moving into the future. I think Minneapolis is a great example of a city that's trying to um, keep itself accountable. They do these annual two pagers about their emissions reductions. You can see this is the most recent one through 2020. They've got their goals. They've got the color coded with the different categories of where stuff is coming from. Um, you'll note in Minneapolis, the, the gray, I'm pointing at my screen, you can't see that. The gray is the natural gas. That's the biggest source of emissions in the city of Minneapolis. Here on the right um, is the Climate Action Plan at, at Actions, Mitigation and Resilience Campaign. I think you sent me this from Northfield. It was basically an update on their Climate Action Plan put out last December where they're making progress with the green, where they're having trouble with the red. Because the thing is, we're doing something we as people have never fully done before. We're trying to change our energy system and make sure we're prepared for a climate we've never inhabited. So we don't know how to do it all. <laughs> and having that mindset of, even if we don't know, we know plenty to make progress and we can learn and get better over time. And then moving forward, you know, the 100% campaign really has focused mostly at the state level in terms of its policy advocacy. Um, but we see really important relationships between the state and local governments. One is this thing called the Regional Indicators Initiative. It's really helped cities um, inventory their emissions, make sense of where emissions are coming from. The Regional Indicators Initiative is struggling with some funding issues. We think it should get state funding more consistently and substantially. It's such a valuable resource in our state and one that we don't want to lose because of funding issues. And then here is House File 2200. It's carried in the House by Representative Samantha Vang. Um, and it's basically uh, several, it, it's several million dollars to um, create grants to fund cities to create climate action plans and to help with technical support to help cities, more cities in the state create climate action plans. So. Um, a, a bill to watch for in terms of um, if you're interested in city climate action plans around the state. And so I'm happy to open it up to questions and conversation. You can find the, um, the paper here at this website. Here's my website or here's my email if you wanna follow up with me. I also am a Twitter user if you want to, that's my Twitter handle if you're interested. Um, so feel free to follow up with me. And then I will also make sure that Michelle, you get a copy of this um, presentation and a link to the website. Because on that website, I gave you this, the basically written report. On that website, there's a really involved spreadsheet where you can look at all the cities that we reviewed and look at the different questions we asked and so learn more in depth about the different approaches. So with that, I'm um, open it up to questions. Hey. Um, we, we had a question uh, in the chat, Kay, about how many cities have inventoried their uh, greenhouse gas emissions of their own operations. Yeah. You know, this is, I don't know the example in terms of the, the specific number of cities that have done that. Um, most of the plans include an inventory of the city operations themselves. That said, city operations are a pretty small percentage of the overall um, emissions of a city. But I do think city operations are where cities can learn. It's where they can give examples. It's where they can lead and show what's possible. Um, so I do think city operations are really important. And things like um, uh, the fleet of local governments, like the cars they drive and the fire trucks and the vehicles that government uses, um, those are a place where cities can really invest um, in showing what in a different technology that we're going to need as part of the overall solution on climate. I've actually even seen like in the city of Boston, they're starting to do some city deliveries and work with e-cargo bikes. I know that wouldn't necessarily work in every city, but um, can work in some places, or even like inspectors going out on e-bikes rather than big vehicles. Thanks, Kate. Uh, if you you under reactions at the bottom of your screen, if you open that up, there is a, a raise your hand. Uh, so, <laughs> given that there's so many of us, rather than all of us going off mute, if you could do that, I will try to uh, keep scrolling through the pages and, and 
see who we've got that wants to, to say something. Uh, uh, Joe or Joanne Ward. Hi, uh, uh, it's both of us here. Uh, you know Joanne. Uh, I'm also a, uh, a member of the local uh, Woodbury and, uh, um, and Cottage Grove League of Women Voters. So uh, we hope to be qualified. I want to just say thank you for this great study. I'm also a member of the Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. Oh, great. And, uh, and there's a number of church groups that are mm -hmm. certified congregations of MNIPL that are doing this work too. And uh, this has come out of that. Um, we're, uh, you know, I just invite, let's have a Woodbury discussion. Uh, the city of Woodbury is uh, frankly now engaged in, a, uh, in, in some planning, uh, in some discernment uh, in their Parks and Natural Resources Commission to determine uh, is there something they might want to do in a strategic initiative in this next cycle. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, encourage everyone uh, who'd like to see this kind of thing to send along their encouragement to the Parks and Natural Resources Commission in the city of Woodbury. Good, good pitch there, Joe. Uh, before we get to Bill, uh, we've had a couple of comments uh, in the chat. The Northfield Planning Commission is trying to codify its action plan in zoning and land development code to give it more teeth. Um, are there other cities that have done this? Mm -hmm. So this is a great question and it kind of depends on, you know, it, where in the comprehensive pan planning process they are, how the climate action plan is seen as fully integrated with other plans um, in the city. So this is actually a best practice I didn't mention, but I think the, the strongest climate action plans are very clear about how the city climate action plan aligns with and works alongside of other city plans. Um, and, and so, yeah, the example of putting it into um, zoning and land development code is really essential in terms of, um, of making the kind of progress needed. You know, the city of Minneapolis took a really big step in this last year uh, by eliminating the minimum number of parking spots needed um, in any single building. And it's not to say you can't have parking, but it's not saying you have to have parking. Parking makes buildings more expensive. It makes it harder to make um, more affordable units. Part of our goal in the city is to have less vehicle miles traveled. So being able to live without cars or with one car, that's an example of putting climate action into the city planning and zoning. Um, and so I, I don't have <laughs> numbers again off the top of my head, um, but it's a really important way um, to do it. And I think as you move forward from these climate action planning processes or climate being part of other city planning processes, having residents who are aware of how they intersect with the decisions cities are making over time is really important. So I'm giving you a fair number of Minneapolis examples because that's my city, it's where I pay a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. So Minneapolis has a really forward looking transportation action plan that is really focused on equity and on sustainability and climate. And um, if you live in Minneapolis, you may see there's been a, ongoing conversations, discussions, fights is probably a good word to describe it about the rebuild of Hennepin Avenue. It's something that only happens every 50 or 60 years. And it's part of the reason it's a big fight amongst advocacy groups and af activists is that it's the first really big test of our city transportation action plan. And so these plans, again, only really make the impact we need if we're actually implementing them. So um, that's a long way to say is you're absolutely right. Getting this into land use planning and zoning is super important. Great. How about Bill? Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. OK. Oh, hi, Kate. Um, hi. It's, it's great to see. I uh, used to work for the Pollution Control Agency for a oh, cool. long time and climate stuff till I retired a couple of years ago. So I seen your career over you know the years so um so my question though is that i've been in it long enough that um it can also be kind of discouraging or um i don't know like why even bother if 
you have seen things long enough where despite all the great resolutions and plans or whatever, our emissions just don't go down and or they keep climbing, except in the electric sector where it seems like we've really done well as a state. So question I've got is I am in Edina and I was on the team that helped prepare the climate action plan that oh, Edina cool. passed in December. And I really, really, because I've also was on the city environmental commission for about nine years and we tried to do a lot of stuff, but it would, it's really hard. How would, what's your recommendation for having citizens help in making sure the plans don't just remain plans, like you said, like, yeah. how do you, act? yeah, and you know, there's some really good opportunities with solar or whatever, and it seems like we have really good plans, but they're very short on detail of who does what and how, mm -hmm. and who are the partners and the resources out there, because we discussed all that as we were preparing the plan and say, yeah, you really need this stuff, and Adina's plan is phenomenally detailed. It's we have the yeah, it's very and, detailed. <laughs> yeah, and paleblue.org, they're awesome as yeah. a consultant resource. But there's so much stuff there. And there's really one sustainability staffer at the city level. So how do you have any ideas? That's I would love to try to volunteer to help, you know, in the way I can, not just our city, but others to move yeah. forward into real results. You know, I think um if there's there's multiple questions in there. So I'm going to start with the first one. I mean, it's hard to not get worried or like think, oh, we've seen this. This is another plan um, and emissions keep going up. And I feel that too sometimes. <laughs> I, will, I will admit, I mean, I think it's important to admit the reality of what we're dealing with. And it is, you know, especially I just turned 40 this year. I have a five-year-old daughter. 2050 is not a theoretical thing to me. Um, she'll be younger than I am in 2050. Uh, and, you know, I've been brought to tears. Um, I can actually get myself to tears when I talk about like looking at her face, um, like when the sun is setting and it's red, it's got that milky red color because of the smoke, um, wildfire mm -hmm. smoke from Canada or the West, which is very much a climate thing um, that we are dealing right. with, even though it's like not far away, but it's here. And I like, how do, I have to decide if I can let her play outside. You know, and I am one of many parents making those kinds of decisions. Um, so uh, you the the way I keep, I just have to keep working at it and trust that other people are going to keep working at it with me. Um, and I I am actually given a lot of hope by the fact that we've made significant progress in the electricity sector, and that we kind of see that path forward because. Getting rid of the carbon in the electricity sector is like essential for us to get it out of everything else. And so I was at a yep. panel a week or so ago and they're like, what's the thing? And I was like, get rid of your natural gas stove. And I was like, that sounds cheesy, but we, for so long, we're like, we can't do this without gas. It's like, well, you can, and there's a great option. And yes, it does take some investment, but like it's healthier for you. You don't have the indoor air quality issues and it's a little way to make our overall system less dependent on fossil fuels. So that's how I keep the hope in terms of um, getting your city to do more to implement. Um, I think getting, being part of the environmental commission and continuing to push uh, city staff and not just push, but say, what resources do you need? What do you need from your elected officials to back up this great work you're doing? Oh, Mayor, you're hiring a public works director. Are you asking them about climate change in terms of what they know and how they approach the job? If you are electing new members to the council, someone like Larry Kraft, who was just elected in St. Louis Park, he ran on a climate change platform. He ran in, 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 in I have, I ran because of climate change in 2006 for the house. I didn't run on like a huge climate change platform. I talked about clean energy. But that's, that's something people are starting to do and it's happening and working. And they're able to then try deliver on um, the promises they're making. But yeah, I think increasing sustainability staff and making sure that staff in every department know that they have ways um, that they're in affecting climate change also really matters. It's I wish I had like the easy one approach answer, <laughs> but I don't, it's like, there's no like one thing in climate, there's pieces of the work that we can all do together and, and trust that it's gonna help us make the progress we need. 
Great. Uh, Great we've uh, Lincoln has his hand up as well. And maybe uh, we'll do Great. one more question after this, and then we'll break into uh, our breakout rooms. How about that? Lincoln. Uh, <clears throat> hello. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for this uh, good information, Kate. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering about uh, how many cities that you know of in Minnesota are part of the uh, National uh, Climate Mayors uh, Organization. Yeah, I don't. I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, okay. Yeah, I. I don't. There, so there's multiple of these sort of national networks and the Climate Mayors Initiative is one of them. The C40 Initiative is one. Um, right. And yeah, I, I don't have, I mean, I, I think it's a fair number of them, but I'm not sure what the number is. Well, I, I just was sort of wondering about how those that are part of those coalitions uh, are doing versus those that are Yeah, if I was going back to do a PhD, this question of our cities with climate mayors, climate committed mayors doing better or not, I would be curious, some enterprising grad student, that'd be a great thesis, but uh, it, yeah, it would take a fair amount of research. I'm just gonna go quick on these questions about the two degrees Celsius. Um, uh, I think the reason the commitments are in two degrees C is because um, the rest of the world use uses Celsius mostly. <laughs> um, and so two degrees is like equivalent to, I don't even know, I can't even, I don't know the conversion, but um, yeah. So it's a little almost, bit more Fahrenheit. Almost four degrees. Almost four degrees, yeah. And we're getting, we're over one degree already. We're getting closer to 1.5. Um, and I would also say that the question about asking about climate at league forums, I hope that you ask about it at every single league forum, because as someone who has been a participant in number of multiple League of Women Voters forums, I will say they're often the best run forums. And if you let some a candidate know that you're going to be asking about that, they will study up on it. And it's a way of educating candidates and raising up an issue. So I think it's really, really important to ask about climate and to ask specifics about climate, ask specifically, what are your commitments in terms of clean energy? What are your commitments in terms of investing in transit? Like trying to break it down a little bit more to some of the detail approaches could be really useful at this point to get beyond the basic, yes, I think climate is a problem and we should take action. I wanna uh, hear from Sue, she's my neighbor in Bryn Mawr. Oh, okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, Kate, um, I'm... I'm wondering about waste management in the cities and all these in the plans of each of these cities. How emissions from waste management, um, how many are composting? Could you just speak on that for a few sentences? Yeah, so um, I would say Minneapolis is pretty far ahead in terms of waste management. The fact that we have organics composting and single sort collection. Um, the, the dealing with waste is a relatively small percentage of a city's overall emissions, but if we can reduce waste, the embodied carbon or like the carbon that comes from all of that stuff is really helpful. Um, and so uh, the, the waste management is often more focused on recycling and then on helping people reuse. There's, there's some moves to organics composting, but I think it's less, um, less common amongst the plans that I was reading or that I that I reviewed. Um, and then I would also add on waste. A, a handful of the plans talked a little bit about um, food and having people move towards more local food and towards more plant-based diets. And this is kind of an interesting thing from, I, I would think a question you might wanna grapple with with your climate action team. So cities don't necessarily have huge impact on the food choices we make, but food choices as an individual are hugely important part of our own individual climate impact. So eating lower on the food chain, so eating a mostly plant-based diet is a significant way to reduce your personal climate impact. Um, it also tends to be healthier. So, you know, bonus to that. Um, but there are some nuances to that, like eggs are, you, are, are like chicken is actually lower carbon often than some kinds of dairy because 
<clears throat> anything in like the beef dairy industry tends is is higher carbon generally. So I think that's a really interesting thing to grapple with as as something as a league of do city climate action plans should we engage with food or not? Um, but we as a league could engage as our individual decision making and learn. We as a community could learn to make delicious, more plant based diets, for example, as a way to take action together. Okay, well, I think that we're going to move into breakout rooms now. Um, I, uh, the ones that I've got that I've seen in the chat are Roseville, Woodbury, Northfield, Edina, and Minneapolis. Um, if you're not from that city, you can go ahead and join that city and listen to what they have to say. I think that's fine. But before we do, uh, let's uh, uh, give uh, Kate uh, some claps or jazz hands <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to thank her for a great uh, presentation and discussion. Thank you. You can't I, hear it, but they're cheering. Yeah, and I, again, I'm so appreciative of you all and your engagement and leadership in your communities. Um, so hopefully this is a resource and do feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or things you wanna chat with me about. Thanks, Thanks so Kate. much. Thank you. So, so Kathleen, I would say, should we say if, if people are going to be part of the breakouts, hang in there. And if you don't want to be part of the breakouts, it was great to see you. <laughs> we'll stay in touch and then we can start assigning people. That's our biggest challenge here once we see who's all together. All right. I know my Woodbury people, so we could start there because that's probably my easier group, right? I can see you all. Here we go. Sort of romper room here, right? Okay, so I am going to pull up. Oh, no, where are my breakout rooms? There we go. Okay, I am Autumn going to manually assign breakout rooms. We're going to have five of them, right? Oh, you can just let the participants choose their room, Michelle. Oh, I haven't done it. Let participants choose their room. Look at that. You see, we're always learning. So do, are people seeing this? What do they see? Will I open all rooms? I've never done that before. I don't know how to do that part, Kathleen. <laughs> what do you do when you- Okay, so I've just created five breakout rooms. <laughs> We're gonna open all the rooms. Let's say Roseville is one, Woodbury is two, Northfield is three, Edina is four, and Minneapolis is five. And then I know we have to pick the time. It'll automatically set the time unless you go to that little gear. You know, on that one, Kathleen, when you're setting them, the breakout rooms. Um. And um, let me go, let's see. Well, we can give it a try. Some of them automatically time unless you fix it. But you, if you only have six or min minutes, you'll talk, it'll say, it should say up top. And then do we want people to come back, Kathleen? Um, sure, that would be fine. Okay. And are you gonna, did you hit it? I thought I did. So I'm seeing fewer unassigned. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where you see it. Do you see it down in your little more? Where do people see it? Oh, there we go. So room two is Woodbury, correct? Uh, yes. And what is room one? Uh, room, uh, room one is Roseville. One is Roseville. Room two. Got a bunch in Edina, that's number four. Yeah. And a bunch in uh, five, which is Minneapolis. Uh, three is Northfield. Here we go.
Anyone need some help? Are you guys seeing it? I don't see anything. Where do people see it? Their rooms. Um, you may have to look under more at the very bottom. And if you click on that, you should see something that says breakout rooms there. Okay. How do, you, how do you get into them? I found the breakout room, but how do you get into it then? There's a join button. There should be a little join button. Uh, and Marlene, I can, I might be able to move you into your room. I would go to Northfield. <laughs> yeah, okay. right. Away. Um, Kathleen, uh, Sherry yeah. from Roseville, um, I'm going into more and all I see is a thumbs up, thumbs down, clap, need a mm. break, and away. I think you're in reactions. It says more down here. Okay. Um, Can we assign them somehow? I couldn't figure yeah, out. Yeah, where 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 are you going? Sherry, you're going to Roseville, is that? Yes, Roseville. Uh, oh. oh, I see. So, oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, going to where you want us to go. <laughs> <laughs> no. And what room was that? What room was Roseville? One. One. OK. So we can send you there, although no one else is there at the moment. Yeah, I don't see anybody else with Roseville. I know, there... it's very disappointing and, and uh, I didn't, didn't publicize it enough. So, okay. That's well, right. you, can, you can join another city if you'd like. Uh, Minneapolis, please. Okay, that's number five. And Marlene Hader, you wanted to go to Northfield, you said? Yes. And that is room... Three. 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 I can send you there. Thank you. Okay, I have uh, somebody from my uh, Roseville League, Gladys Jones. Oh, sure. Yeah, we can put you there. Can, uh, can we go back to being Roseville number one? Yeah, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm into this now. I figured out how to do this. <laughs> okay. I'm moving people all over the place. <laughs> this is fun. Look at, I learned something new. All right. Gladys, I thought we sent Gladys. She has to hit join, hopefully she'll hit join. I moved you to one, Gladys. You have to hit join. We haven't figured that part out. How about Janet Stavros? Do you want to go somewhere fun and exciting? <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, Janet. Oh, OK. I would like to, I'm not sure where to go. I, I, there are several from St. Cloud, but we don't seem to have a, a breakout room. So um, yeah, I'll, go I, with Marlene, I, I'll go with Marlene. She's a St. Cloud gal. Okay, in room three. Marlene Hader, you're gonna go with her? Sure. All right, here you go. <laughs> and how about you, Yvonne? Do you wanna go anywhere? <laughs> Yvonne's hanging out. And Gladys, I haven't been able to. Oh, Janet, where can we send you, Janet? <laughs> She's gonna hang with us. I I'm I think you just put me with Marlene in, in uh, Northfield. Oh. Yeah. Is that, is that right? But I think what you have to do is there's a little spot somewhere. There's a button that says join. Join breakout room. Is that yep. it? That's it. Yep. You want to hit that. that. Be and it. Mm -hmm. Same with you, Gladys Jones. There should be a little blue join breakout room. And you want to hit that, Gladys. And you could hang out with Sherry that way. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Yvonne. I'm Yvonne. Well, I had to go with a phone call and whatever here. So I'm not going to be able to join anything tonight, but I'm okay. really glad I got in on it. Thanks. Oh, good. Well it's great to have well you. Thank glad you. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, well done. You know, I've seen that picture. Mute. You don't have your sweater on. <laughs> no, fun. 
So Gladys, if you hear us, you can hit the join button somewhere and hang out with Sherry. And poor Sherry's all by herself over there. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know about that, Kathleen. Now, I don't know how to move people. I, I was trying that and I don't seem to be getting the hang of that. Yeah, yet. that's fun. I'm sticking them everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, it went well, I thought. I think it's great. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And there's just a lot we can do. I am going to definitely um, have um, Callan talk to Kate about how she thinks we should best structure this question. I think she'd be the perfect one to kind of help out a bit here. Because um, we're trying to get the question itself really more figured out so that you know, what do we want to measure, right? What is, what, what would a climate note actually, is it greenhouse gas emissions period? Or is it something else? Or is it, you know, what are we gonna? Uh, I've been, I've been noodling that. I'm in a, a University of Minnesota extension and the, what is it? Uh, uh, sustainable, resilient, partnership and right, right. Mm -hmm. you know have this program called community climate communicators and there's uh 20 of us in that cohort from all over minnesota and one of the things that we need to do is some sort of a project and so i talked and there's a, a there's a team of about seven professors that uh, are working with this group uh, and I brought the issue of a climate note up and several of them were very interested. Oh, so cool. uh, what I've been trying to do is to sort of go through the $2.7 billion that the governor proposed just to have stuff to work with mm -hmm. and then just try to group things. Well, okay, these things, you know, like a building, mm -hmm. you could, you could build it such that it doesn't use as much carbon emissions, right? right. So that's something where it's sort of emissions related. Mm -hmm. But something like EV chargers, well, they don't do anything in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. They simply enable. Right. That. So there seems to be, so that's mm -hmm. not really emissions. That should, that kind of feels like that right. belongs in a different category. So mm -hmm. I I'm trying to, kind of group all of the different proposals um, into different categories and then see, and then they get the reaction of these uh, professors to see how it is that they um, look at things. Mm -hmm. um, just from my own time, um, uh, you know, as a township supervisor and the three awful floods that we had three years in a row mm -hmm. you know there were bridges that and roads that needed to be replaced so much earlier that you know it's so they need to be replaced it's not reducing emissions it's not really making things bigger stronger so it's not apt at adaptation but it's a climate cost just a oh, straight yeah. out climate cost. And so that seemed like maybe that's a category. Uh, but then there's a whole different category of, well, you know, instead of a 12 foot, foot culvert, you have to have a 14 foot culvert and mm -hmm. you need to have wings on it, you know, just to anticipate future flooding. Well, that seems like more like adaptation, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't reduce emissions, but it prevents damage in the future. So that seems like that's a category. So I've been trying to work to Interesting. Uh, yeah. sort of noodle it out. You know, I don't want to if interfere with Callan's work at all. No, I but, mean, she uh, needs the input, though. I mean, because, you know, she's, I feel like in order to give her something to really noodle on and get, you know, kind yeah. of get done with, we probably, we want to focus on a, a real core question. Yeah. And my sense has been the easiest thing to do would be to look at assigning, you know, the emissions to what are the emissions costs? What are the costs to our climate? 
of buildings of the of the you know of the actual bonding bill <clears throat> it may have other like for example building building a structural bridge because you have to redo it because of a flood that was you know so you could say well that's gonna it's definitely gonna add to the emissions um, but if it's a replacement, then it really wouldn't be, it might be neutral, you know, I mean, in the sense of that. But, and it doesn't also assign, a, you know, the point is just to come up, it's like the money, the money is, it's just a figure, it gives you a way to analyze those figures against everything else, it's not making a judgment. So, you know, one simple thing might be to come up with, like you said, maybe there's different ranks but yeah. at least she could focus on maybe just the emissions how do you measure the emissions of these projects and include that alongside the finance bill and you know oh wow this has a cost to our climate of x amount of emissions right i i pointed to her and i'll i i think i gave her the name but let me give her a little more information in one of the uh hearings last week, a professor from the U um, who was, I don't know, he, he's uh, in a technical area. He is looking at um, uh, developing a standard for embedded carbon. So this is the material, the construction, the waste, uh, you know, the, all of those things that would be mm -hmm. embedded in a building. So, mm -hmm. um, and evidently there are maybe some international standards that one could use for this. Well, that's, that's something that you could yeah. really um, identify. Right. The other thing that I didn't know existed is that there is a building standard for, for operating uh, and, and the, the larger general obligation bonds must fit, must meet this SB 2030 standard, which is as of 2020, 80% efficiency. Mm. By 2025, it'll be 90% efficiency. By 2030, it'll be 100% efficiency. I didn't know that was yeah. part that, well, that's, that's uh, you know, that's quite a bit. It yeah. is 708. Should we maybe close the rooms and yeah, do you give wanna, them a couple can, minute warning? I can broadcast out to everyone. Um, two minute warning and yeah. come back to wrap up. Let's let's do that. So um, I've been trying to scramble to 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 find some things to help point her in, <laughs> you know, in some kind yes. of a direction. Yeah. The other thing that I thought might be helpful is um, there's your message um, is to find out what is the procedure for creating a proposal. Can is it just an administrative thing to ask that the description include. Um, this project meets SB 2030 standards. Mm -hmm. I, you know, so that citizens could at least see from the description right. what's going on. Yeah. Um, so maybe not as far as a climate note, but mm -hmm. but at least more transparent for for uh, right. for folks. Yeah. Um. All right. Shall we bring them back? I'll wait till it hits. There it goes, 710. Ready? I'm going to cool the <laughs> room. Woo! Goodbye, people. I hate to, like, you know, end good conversation, but. I know, but we also need to call it. Yeah. Okay. They've got 60 seconds now. Okay. Oh, this is fun. I'm using this at council, this pick your own breakout room. That's a great way to do it. Oh, there's always more to learn, it's, Kathleen. Yeah, I know. It's, well, it's much less work to let people do it themselves. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I should take Zoom training. I should do this. I should do that. I'm like, I can't do anymore. Oh, boy. <laughs>
We keep trying. Mm. 18, 17. I'm, I'm going to ask um, each of the groups, you know, what was, what was the big idea <laughs> that you had? Welcome back. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sure we interrupted. <laughs> Great conversations. I'd like to hear from uh, Roseville. What was your big idea? It was okay. Sherry on her own. Kathleen, yeah, nobody showed up in my room. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. It was kind of pathetic, really. Oh, well, you've yeah. got a lot going on in Roseville. We'll give you a pass this time, Sherry, and come back with more. You guys are about, doing great work there. How right, about you. Woodbury? Wally, do you want to say something? Well, we had a great uh, spirited conversation about how to move forward in Woodbury. And Woodbury uh, is considering a strategic initiative, initiative on environmental stewardship, which would include um, climate action plan. And that's now being uh, discussed at uh, both the city council level and at the uh, uh, commission of uh, parks and natural resources. So that's back, we'll be back on uh, March 1st at parks and natural resources uh, for more discussion. And we asked uh, that uh, notes be sent to uh, uh, Commission uh, Michelle Okada in uh, uh, Woodbury, the uh, uh, staff that uh, is in charge of that commission. Please add anything. And I want to add, I want to add to Wally the importance of commissions, right? The opportunity that all these commissions are led often by citizens. So that is a, to, you, to what Bill said and Body Dina and something we could really promote within all leagues is get yourself on these commissions, right? Because uh, there's a voice there. Great. How about Northfield? We spend a lot of time talking about um, recycling and how to clarify it and make it work better, both uh, plastics and uh, organics. That's a big topic. Thanks, Brian. Uh, how about Edina? Maybe they all left. No, we didn't. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Colleen, you're muted. I was just checking for something. Um, yeah, exactly. Now, we, um, I think we had uh, folks that have worked on the climate action plan for uh, about a decade ago, and, um, and some that have worked on the most recent one as well. And we talked about how we need to take some baby steps, not go for, you know, in 2050, it's gonna be this, but in the next year or two, what can we do? Um, and um, I I, if anybody else wants to add something, please say so. Please speak up. We also agreed we wanna talk more right. with each other, yes. make some connections. Great. Okay, and Minneapolis. Okay, so it was Minneapolis that actually left, not Edina. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming this evening. Bethany, um, I do read your note in the chat and uh, we'll try to get um, your question out to folks as best we can. Um, thank you all for joining this discussion. I hope it helped. I hope that you all will think about a local, uh, a local league challenge for something uh, around climate 
or the environment in your own community. Um, because as Kate said, uh, com communities are important. And I'll, you I'll email you, Bethany. I got your email. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.